decided to frame it, uh, the title of this talk is 10 Things That I Have, That I Think I've Learned in My 16 Years of Blinking at Visionary Culture. And uh, they're not necessarily going to flow in a way that makes total sense. And uh, I, will, I will buttress them all. Some of them are very practical. Some of them have to do with the question of does if we posit Burning Man as a good example of visionary culture, does a visionary culture only get to live in a one-week-a-year environment? Uh, that's, I think, something that people who get excited about Burning Man always have to grapple with. It's like, okay, I had a great time, had a terrible time, fascinated, want to go back. Um, what, what can I do with this? And um, I'm, I'm speaking as someone who's been going uh, for, to Burning Man for 16 years uh, straight, and it, it occurred to me a few years ago that that might not be the best use of Burning Man, <laughs> that there might be something wrong with going to Burning Man 16 times in a row. Um, and if you, as many of you, if you hung around like old doddering, you know, oldest living Confederate Burning Man widow tells all types, you will probably know that a certain ambivalence about the experience seems to sink in, and, and a, lot of, a lot of that will probably come through, but I do want to preface any of that ambivalence with saying that I, 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 I may, I use and endorse Burning Man, uh, you know, have for 16 years and, and still do. Um, uh, lesson number one, which is, is a phrase that I found resonated a lot with devotees of underground culture. Um, they liked the notion that what they did was something so different from what everyone else around them did that they took a certain pride in that and, uh, and they wanted to keep what they had underground. It was not for everyone's eyes. Um, if you're into esoterical, magical traditions, uh, this might make a lot of sense to you as well. And, and I, I've always gotten why people into the esoteric loved their esotericness, uh, but uh, as obviously as someone who went to write a whole book about it, I, I worked through that and came to the conclusion that it does not serve the experience of special, wonderful things to try to hold them to yourselves and keep them secret. That said, and you know, if we open this up to discussion, there are unquestionably things, and any Burning Man old timer will tell you, that warp the experience when the experience widens out to more people. Unquestionably, it's a very different experience now uh, than it was in 1995 uh, when I started going, but it's still a valuable experience. And it just struck me ultimately as grossly possessive to take whatever it is you loved about something when it was small and uh, and decide that that was so important to you that you were not going to let anyone else enjoy the experience, take on the experience, take over the experience, and turn it into something uh, that's valuable for them. So to, to any devotee of a visionary culture, I think secrecy, uh, in, internalism, uh, cliqueishness um, are, are to be fought. Uh, but that leads us to lesson number two, which is uh, that uh, visionary or no, people are going to be people. And uh, people love being cliquish, um, and even in an environment like uh, Burning Man, where I think most of us feel at least encouraged to try to be our best, our sunniest, our most creative, our, our freest uh, selves, uh, especially if you do it longer and longer, you're, you're, you're going to find that it, it hasn't made angels of you, and it hasn't made angels of anyone around you, you know. You're going to do the theme camp, and some people are not going to do everything that they said they would do. And someone's going to gossip too much and be really annoying, and someone's not going to show up when they said they, they're going to show up. And, and uh, people uh, are, are absolutely going to annoy and enrage you and, and be themselves in, in every way possible, uh, in both the best and worst senses. Um, and it's great to recognize, not great, it's necessary to recognize and embrace that. Like, don't get driven away from these glimmers of a better world that you see, whether it be through Burning Man or any other example of a visionary culture, by the disappointment of human beings uh, being human. Just uh, embrace and understand that that's, uh, that that's the way it's going to be. Um, 
I was going to say this leads us to point three, but I don't know if it really leads us to it necessarily. This is sort of going off in another direction, but it actually ties into uh, to re-evolution. Uh, and this was a great lesson I learned from watching Burning Man for 16 years, and then sort of as a researcher going back to the years, the, the, the nine years before I got there. You don't know what's going to happen when you embark on any endeavor, any creative endeavor, any visionary endeavor, um, it is, you're going to want to plan it probably, or you're going to think you want to know what you're doing, but you don't know what you're doing. I mean, when, uh, when to, to take it back specifically to, to Burning Man again, when, you know, when, when Jerry James and Larry Harvey built a little eight-foot scrap sculpture uh, in 1986 and burned it on the beach, um, they did not intend to, you know, build a countercultural theme park or, or whatever, you know, you want to call a Burning Man uh, today. There was never, ever any point in, in the evolution of, of this event, which, which was interesting to learn, in which anyone intended to make it, any one person intended to make it what it became. It just created a space and an image uh, and was open for people to come to that space, first on a beach in San Francisco for five years, and then uh, in the Black Rock Desert. And it, it has now become something, again, some of this has probably sound kind of obnoxious in, 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 in an old man way. I, I hope none of this sounds uh, uh, patronizing to, to anyone who hasn't been going for 16 years, but uh, like even, you can come into it now and it feels like a thing. It has a pretty set meaning, it has a pretty a set of signifiers, whether it be, you know, people on stilts juggling fire and fur, or <laughs> machine art, or, uh, or, or the ten principles that are imposed on, uh, on regionals. Um, it didn't start with any of that. that. That was not built, that was not planned, that, that evolved. Um, in the best interpretation of it, which, which I like to embrace, um, it evolved as necessary reactions to what happens when you invite 80, and then 200, and then 400, and then 4,000, and then 12,000, and then 60,000 people mm -hmm. to a really weird, difficult place and, and create a, a, an implied atmosphere of reckless freedom. Um, you, uh, the cops are going to show up. Um, you're going to have to start telling people they can't drive anymore. You're going to have to start telling people if you're going to make a really big fire, uh, you're going to have to talk about it to fire marshals first. But none of that was true when I started going to Burning Man. It, none of that was true at all. You just showed up. The city had no shape. Um, you could blow up and burn anything you wanted, wherever you wanted. There were a few cops around, but they really just kind of wandered around you know, with their eyes rolling because there weren't enough of them and they really couldn't do anything about anything. Um, with re-evolution, uh, we, uh, I hope Casey doesn't mind me saying this, we, we started with ambitions and plans that ended up being bigger than we're probably going to be able to do. Like, we made that video in a more grandiose mindset uh, than we're at now, and, uh, and I, I think uh, that's been a great lesson. But I think by starting with the resources that are organically ours, this is the people, you know, who through Burning Man started with the resources that were organically theirs, which at that point was really a small circle of friends all from San Francisco. Um, amazingly ridiculous uh, things can grow, and, and they're going to grow best if you don't know what you're doing or if you haven't planned what you're doing, which this does actually lead to lesson number four, uh, which is optimism is a powerful tool. Um, Never let go, whatever you're, I have some, I have a, a certain sense that humans have a little bit more of the insect to them than we like to think. You know, insects are sort of, have this genetic case system where like you're a certain kind of insect and you're built to do a certain thing. Um, we're certainly way freer than that, but I, I, I do feel like as I move through life, I notice that there's certain people who are certain types, and I know that certain types are, are not bound to be optimistic, and I think that's a good thing to fight in yourself if, if you are 
temperamentally gloomy, but you want to see interesting and great things happen into the, in the world, uh, believe they can. I learned this lesson super vividly uh, at, at Burning Man. Um, I'm not, uh, now I'm a journalist by profession, I'm not a, a builder, I'm not a skilled user of tools, but you, know, you quickly learned, especially back in the late 90s uh, there, that you weren't going to have as much fun as you otherwise could if you didn't uh, help people build things. So I would just randomly apprentice myself. And it was easier back then to just do it when you got there. Um, just walk around and, you know, if someone needs help. And um, I was shocked to discover that some of the biggest, most elaborate uh, projects, in, in the case of one that's most on my mind in 2000 when I worked on, that was called The Faces of the Man, which was three, like, 25-foot-tall uh, metal face frames, one covered in wood, one covered in sod, and one covered in copper that wept things out of their eyes. That The, the artist making it, uh, uh, Dan Das Man, did not have, didn't know when he started how he was going to finish. Um, it shocked me with my personality that you could do something that involves so much material and so many people and so much money and so much ego at stake and uh, and just trust in a your native wiliness uh, trust in you know the process trust that people who knew how to do things you didn't know how to do were going to show up trust that people who were going to be able to do things you didn't have time to do I mean I, I spent three days attaching sod to a metal frame is something anyone could have done, um, but who knew that someone would show up to do it? Um, and there's an enormous set of possibilities that open to you if you don't assume that you have to know uh, how it's going to work. And it won't work if you are not using that ultimate tool of optimism, of just as, uh, thrusting yourself into it uh, with uh, a belief that in the largest sense, the universe is a good place or that people will help you do an important thing that needs to be done. Uh, this is swallowing off in a slightly different direction. I think it touches on uh, point five here. It touches on the question of does Burning Man and things like Burning Man qualify as visionary experiences? Um, the, 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 the way I've written this point is you can't always intellectually defend your and I wrote the word valuable experience, but I think I'll switch visionary in it because I think that's actually what I meant uh, when I wrote this anyway. Um, there's a lot about Burning Man that say to an outside, I mean, I don't know what anyone hears mother or like, but let's take a stereotypical image of a mother, which my mother fits pretty well, like that you wouldn't necessarily be able to defend to mom that what you're doing out there is like, a really good thing. It's not just it's not just indulgent bullshit. It's not just getting really fucked up on drugs and dancing and 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 I, I'm going to tell two stories on myself that again I, I cannot defend them. These behaviors are it was wrong what I did in both of these two stories, and yet I, I still am really glad I did them. Um, and I, I think that. The, the the trickster archetype is very much at play out there in a way that I think most people enjoy. And uh, a particular trickster uh, who I met out there, a man named Chris Radcliffe, whose story I tell in my book, one of the uh, very old timers. Um, he, he makes it. He, he is a deliberate wizard of inciting people to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. And um, he, uh, I don't know if any of you guys were out there in the, probably 2000 to 2003, I think this art vehicle was out there, a Drock of the Dragon, a extremely long, you know, set of little different vehicles combined together with the, uh, the very convincing look of a dragon, and we were out there. It was not Burning Man itself. It was one of the Fourth of July uh, gatherings, and Draka was out there, and her creator was out there, and there was maybe a few hundred of us. And one morning, uh, Chris Radcliffe began hounding me for hours that I must steal the dragon. It was sitting there. He knew where the keys were. He could he could tell me how to turn it on. He could direct me, because of course, I, I don't even like driving, you know, a minivan. I, I drive small cars. I, 
I, I, I don't like stealing things. I don't like driving really long things. Um, and he, he, he worked on me and, and it ground on. Somehow he convinced me that it would make a difference in my life if I could conquer whatever fear or anxiety or limitation I placed on myself. And um, he, he worked it really well. Um, he And he... he he went in there with me and like showed me how to turn it on. And he had initially promised that he would help me navigate, but the instant that the vehicle was on and I was behind the wheel and he could see that I would indeed be able to drive it, he just quietly walked away. <laughs> and completely by myself for, you know, about 40 minutes around dawn, I drove the dragon around and I decided to take it to right in front of the trailer where its creator and owner lived. Um, and, uh, she took it reasonably well. She was upset that it was almost out of gas by the time uh, it, it got back. Um, and <laughs> I did, in, in ways that I, again, could neither defend nor explain, I did, I did feel that having pushed through all of the reasons that that struck me as completely undoable or wrong or too scary, um, uh, it, it was good that I did it. And I think it gave me strength to do other, perhaps less, stupid things that I was afraid to do um, in the future. Um, which does kind of lead uh, to point six, and this is a very practical point about the building of a visionary life within the culture we live in. Um, just as point one, what we do is not secret, uh, I will also add here point six, um, or seven, no six. What we do is usually against the law in some way or another. Um, and if it, if it starts being against, and what I mean by that is if you want to do something like a Burning Man, you want to do something like a Lightning in a Bottle, you want to do something like a Re-Evolution, you, uh, you want to even do something like live in the spaces in San Francisco or LA where most of the people build the things that fill those spaces, you are almost certainly running afoul of local government, city government, uh, federal government, some way or another, that this life, choosing this life makes you almost inevitably an outlaw, even if it makes you just an outlaw against zoning laws. Um, I, I spent a long time thinking about one particular example of this. There's this Berkeley-based uh, art space that arose out of the Burning Man community called the Shipyard that uh, you know, they, they chose the elegant and uh, uh, very non-wasteful living solution of using uh, shipping old shipping containers as uh, as both their workspaces and their living spaces. They stacked a bunch of shipping containers. You know these things exist in the, the tens of thousands when their useful life has ended. I mean this is sort of a sub lesson that I think most of us learn from Burning Man. It's like the the junk of the world is not junk. Like everything has another life to live, and, and it's, it's, it's both uh, elegant and, and sensible and, and a good way to move through the world to not treat anything as junk, to figure out a way to, to repurpose what previous human ingenuity, uh, previous effort has already given us. Um, and they, you know, tried to do their fire shows, and they tried to build their eco-conscious engines that uh, that burned uh, coffee grounds uh, through the uh, the almost forgotten art of gasification. I mean, they, they really should have been a feather in the city of Berkeley's cat, but the city of Berkeley didn't see it that way. Uh, there was no existing coding uh, for earthquake and fire for things built out of shipping containers, and it became this horrible three-year battle that just sort of ate up all of the energy of everyone involved. And uh, th th there's, there's not a happy lesson to the end of this story, but it's just remembering that if you're going to embark on unusual ways of living, unusual ways of building, and using any kind of space, either public or private, to do something unusual, um, be aware that you're almost certainly breaking the law. There's other, there's lots of ways to choose to deal with this. Some are to be responsible in the most normal sense and figure out how to get the permits and get the permits and you know do do everything the right way. Burning Man has mostly chosen that solution. Um, sort of other, maybe less rich or maybe more rich, uh, you know, visionary culture gangs uh, like uh, the Rainbows have sort of chosen different ways to deal with uh, the illegality of what they're doing. But it's important to remember, uh, it's important to, to have someone on your team who knows how to navigate the illegality of the world if you're trying to do something interesting like that. And uh, 
And, you know, as, as somewhat of a professional libertarian myself, I hope it also makes some of you think about, uh, you know, the, the, the basic sense of some of the ways that uh, our culture restricts our ability to do things. Um, while I hit the libertarian point, I think that almost leads into uh, a, a particularly controversial uh, point I find about the Burning Man experience. I'm going to express it this way, that uh, our culture's wealth can be spiritually enriching. Um, Burning Man sort of uh, leads its chin out on this point by creating this sacred space, you might call it, that's supposed to be free of what they call commodification, that's supposed to be free of the exchange of money while you're in that space. I mean, it, it's very easy and, and, and very true to point out that, of course, hey, well, they're charging tickets, and, uh, and why are they selling ice, and why do they run a cafe? Um, some of those arguments, I think, are worthwhile. But the, the, the most important thing, I think, to remember, if you're going to be oppositional to the general, you know, quasi-capitalist modern system of, of mass production, of, of dealing with a wide range of human relationships through what we call the cash nexus, is uh, that that does give us the worldly wealth to indulge our spiritual and visionary side, that we could not experiment at Burning Man with living in a world without commerce and living with a world without exchange cash if we didn't have uh, the wealth and opportunities, the time, the petroleum, the machines, the packaged foods, the, you know, all, all of the, the other things that we bring out there, that it's, uh, it is interesting, and uh, uh, from you know what I know of the Evolver mindset, and, and Daniel Pinchbeck has been a, a pal and a sparring partner to me uh, over the course of the years, and he and I don't see eye to eye on this point at all. But I do think it, it, thinking harder about your relationship to this culture's material wealth um, is a valuable thing to do, and I think in, in some cases it's more worthwhile than uh, some of you might first think. Um, leading to point eight, the energy to do any visionary thing you want to do is going to come from unexpected places. But when I when I started doing the journalism work and writing this book, I mean, I've been hanging out with, in the world of Burning Man for five years before I thought of writing about it. And I, I knew everyone pretty well, but I didn't really know their backstories. And, uh, and the, the enormous range of who these people were who laid the groundwork for Burning Man were extremely impressive. There's from, you know, uh, transvestite street hustlers and drug runners and sociologists and, you know, computer coders and obsessed lunatics who had turned, you know, their entire house into literal piles of junk and, uh, you know, and then people who were teaching at, uh, at uh, major universities. Uh, there was an enormous an enormous range of human energies and human experience went into this. I think it's, well, for, you know, friends are great and cliques are great and your communities of affinity are great. I think the greater things are going to come from widening out who you're going to listen to, who you're going to work with, uh, people who aren't just the people who you would normally be. And, and Burning Man became a great engine of, like, sucking all sorts of different people in and, and creating this vortex of cultural connection and cultural conflict uh, that, that built what we see today that would not have happened if it was just a bunch of people who already felt really comfortable with each other. Um, leading us to point, uh, what I had was going to be point uh, 10, I'm now going to make point 9, that the process has its own value. Um, I came to the conclusion a long time ago with my own head about Burning Man that uh, I put it this way at first, that it was not, what was valuable about it was not the thing of the thing, whatever the end result of the thing was. What was valuable about it was uh, first the people of the thing and second of all the, the, the action of the thing, making the thing, whether it be literally a thing, a, a work of huge art, a, a theme camp. Um, Burning Man writ large, that uh, there was no point in approaching it like a critic. Um, you know, well, sometimes it's a point. You know, it, it, sometimes it is fun to, to, to get in a bad mood and, and bag on things, and, and I get as <laughs> much pleasure that as others, but uh, maybe more. But uh, that uh, ultimately embracing 
embracing the joys of what you were all going through, um, especially in the environment of the Black Rock Desert, uh, especially, you know, had to be part of it. That if you're not enjoying everything from the weather to everything you have to do to build your shelter, and I'm, I'm saying burning on specific things, but these could all be metaphorical about a lot, a lot of other things as well. The building the shelter, the building the shelter again after the windstorm knocks it down. Um, you know, the, the, the cooking the food under bad circumstances, the hurting yourself, uh, you know, trying to build the thing, the crying when the tools break. Um, if you can't ultimately, like, breathe in joy when you are, you know, rolling in the dirt, cursing how wrong everything is going, that, you know, you need to be able to breathe that moment with joy as well, or, or Burning Man is not going to work for you, and, and again, you can apply that metaphor to the larger life. Um, yourself. Um, my last point, which is this is going to be a little bit more didactic and uh, probably argumentative, is um, uh, that I learned from Burning Man is that uh, uh, anarchy can work, though it's kind of a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> this is uh, this is the arc of the Burning Man story that I make a great deal of in my book because it resonates with me the most. I mean, I I. I, I before Burning Man, I was like a comic book guy and a science fiction guy and a, and a libertarian politics guy, and I felt Burning Man really brought a lot of that to life in really strange ways. I felt like I was hanging out with superheroes, you know, and I was hanging out with people like Dr. Megavolt and the amazing rubber boy, like the literal real world representations of, of superheroes. My, my friend Sid Kling, who builds a Tesla coil, is essentially Doc Savage, if any of you have ever read those old pulp novels. I mean, that's who this guy is, is as close to that as you can uh, get in, in real life, you know, a multidisciplinary scientific genius, you know, super handsome, dashing world traveler, goes to China and digs up terracotta warriors and builds robots of them and all this stuff. Um, it was delightful, but the politics end of it also interested me, because Burning Man did start in a, a genuine anarchy, and it's become something that's a lot more ordered, and it's become something that's a lot more policed. But I still think all that is kind of just an illusion, um, and I especially think that when I'm arguing with old-timers who don't want to go anymore because it's too rules-based and, and too uh, cop-based. I mean, ultimately, everything that makes Burning Man work as a civic order has nothing to do with the rules. It really does have to do with the choices most of us make to be reasonable and intelligent enough to not build things that are going to break and hurt us or others, to not fuck with other people's property or lives. Um, I mean, the cops clearly are mostly there just to do what they want to do. They're not actually helping impose order. I mean, there are roads there because the Burning Man organization builds roads with the uh, ticket money that we give them, which you can look at as a tax, but, you know, we're all willingly paying it. We're all there by choice. The, the amenities of civilization are, are provided, and it's provided in, in a very voluntary way. Um, the enforcement of rules such as it is, I think, really is 100% voluntary despite the existence of cops and rangers. And uh, I, I think that's also a, a worthwhile lesson to remember in crafting your own communities and crafting your own uh, shots at visionary culture. Um, the last prepared little thing I'm going to say before we start chatting, um, you know, one of probably most of us don't resonate very well with one of the core uh, spiritual facts, is facts of what I'm looking for, about the culture that we grew up in, which is your classic Christian tradition, um, and I, I'm not a, an embracer or believer in it myself, but there is one one thing uh, said, uh, and I, I don't recall if it was said by Jesus about himself or, or by one of his apostles about him that I, I think applies to, to Burning Man as well, not to sound like a cultist, uh, which is that, um, uh, that Burning Man, like Jesus, came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And I think whatever meaning you put in that visionary experience or any visionary experience, I think that you, if you are feeling, you know, that breath, I love the breathing exercise you did earlier. I never do anything like that, but I did it because I was asked to do it. And, and it does fill you uh, with something interesting. And it, it, it feels, there is a, a basic, unexplainable, words aren't going to help feeling of being alive on earth and feeling like that's valuable and meaningful and uh, and I think I know Burning Man does that for lots of people and uh, ultimately whatever meaning we attach to it I, I might fall back on just saying that that feeling might be enough and
and that's the end of my talking at you.